made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I need a third arm, though, because it's hard to have a clicker and a Bible and, and everything, but I'm um, spoiled with the lapel mic. Um, but I wanted to say a special welcome to um, some of our uh, visitors today. Um, it's good to see the Petersons back there, um, Cl Bev and Cliff and Cliff, Cliff Jr., Cliff Sr., and I don't think Cliff would, Sr. would be offended if, if I say that he's 96 years young and I was out at his house um, recently and he has a two acre garden that he plants and cultivates and harvests all by himself Amen. yeah and uh, maybe that's why he's still 96 years young and so it's just always inspires me when I see Cliff Sr. Uh, it's, and, and Junior uh, just amazing to see that he is still in good health. And um, it's always good to see Margie as well uh, coming and your recent decision to be baptized. Good to see you, Dana. And also the, the family next door, the Tehel family. And uh, there was somebody else too. Yes, yeah, Shauna's father who's here. Uh, oh, yes, I know. Uh, in the back, yeah. I, and sometimes people don't like me doing this. They say it might embarrass people, but... And I've, I'll face the risk of being stoned afterward. But it's good to see Rochelle and her mother. I knew Rochelle's father uh, recently, well, passed away a number, a few years back. And she drove two hours to get here. Yeah, all the way from Purdy, clear out toward Bremerton. And so, uh, long ways. So we're going to have to catch up. But um, I thank you for coming and... And, you know, the, the message I'm going to share this morning, the next couple of weeks, is really a, kind of a post-series series, a couple of messages that are on the heels of our prophecy series. So uh, forgive me if I talk about prophecy uh, today and the next week and the weekend after with our speaker, but I felt like sharing something that um, would help kind of tie in our, our meetings, uh, purposes and principles of Bible prophecy. I wanted to look at some things today, and so let's have a, an added word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, thank you for the word of God that is living in our souls. Thank you for the prophetic word that is like a light that shines in a dark place, that shines in the brightness of our minds and in our hearts until the day dawn and the morning star, Jesus Christ, arises anew in our hearts. Lord, may we look through the lens of biblical prophecy today with fresh eyes, with a humble heart that as we see things and maybe things that we know may some, some new things jump out at us as we share. May the Holy Spirit, the author of Scripture, uh, come into each and every heart. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Some of you may have heard of the, some of the mythical Greek legends. I'm not so much into them, but one legend and myth that really illustrates a powerful lesson. It was a, a famous hero, an individual, Theusus. He escaped from this Cretan labyrinth, they say, this baffling maze that was built by the famous Greek architect. No one had ever been able to go into this labyrinth and escape except for this young man, Theusus, this young Greek mythical hero. He plunged into the labyrinth and supposedly slain the monitor at the center, the beast at the center of this labyrinth. But then he realized, how am I going to get out of this bewildering maze? But then he remembered. He reached into his pocket and he pulled out a ball of silver thread that he remembered that a young Cretan maiden gave him and he remembered that he tied it off as he went in and there it was connected his way out of that maze. It guided him out. That silver thread was unwound as he entered that maze and it guided him out as he made his way out of that mass of confusion. And today, there is a mass of confusion concerning Bible prophecy. And as some of you have come to this series, you've been learning and have learned many things that have been confusing out there in the world. And what things have been taught concerning Bible prophecy. You see, a correct understanding of Bible prophecy is like a silver thread that will lead us through the mass and maze of confusion out there today within Christianity. It's like a guiding principle that will guide us in life. You see, it's something unique to Christians. The Christian worldview, specifically prophetic worldview, is unique among world religions. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the largest religion, the second largest religion in the world contain no prophecy. The belief of Islam, the writings of Muhammad, contain no prophecy. Christianity being the largest, but, but many or most of the largest world religions contain no prophecies in their writings, in their sacred text. The writings of Muhammad, the followers of some 1.7 billion people, 24% of the world's population, and yet no prophecy. There's something about the Bible that's unique, that sets it apart, that sets it aside and distinct from other world religions. We have a unique worldview when it comes to prophecy. The writings of Buddha contain no prophecy. Another large, major world religion. And I've traveled to different places like India and other places and where they embrace the Buddha and his writings and as you share principles from the Word of God and even prophecies, they are open and in tune to what it says because they have nothing in their writings like the Scriptures. You can even learn of the writings of Confucius contain no prophecy. Nothing in a prophetic matter in those texts. Notice with me Isaiah 46. Turn with me to Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. And I want to look at something this morning, and I think this was shared in our seminar. But Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, notice what it says. The Lord speaking here, and He says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like Me. Now, why can God make a claim that He is God, and there's nobody else like Him? He clarifies why He can say that. Notice, verse 10, He declares the end from the beginning. From ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Why can God claim that He is a God above all others? Because He knows the end from the beginning. Amen? He knows the future. And it's revealed through the prophetic words, through the writings of the Bible. Amen? 
Why can he make such claims? Turn with me to our scripture in 2 Peter. 2 Peter. You know, as I was chewing on this text in 2 Peter, this text is amazing. Notice what it says. Let's begin in verse number 16. Notice what Peter is saying here. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Evidently, there were fables that were being fabricated, myths and legends during Peter's time. And he said, no, we weren't following those fables. He said this, he said, but we were eyewitnesses. We saw it with our own eyes, His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to Him from the excellent glory, this is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now where is Peter making a reference to? You're not sure? I'll, I'll, I won't give it away, but by a picture. Remember that? He was there. The Mount of Transfiguration. He saw it. He was an eyewitness, first-hand evidence of the power and the majesty and the glory of God. And that's what he's saying. He said, we didn't follow a fable. We didn't follow a myth. No legend. No. We saw it. And notice what else he says here. And we heard the voice. So they saw it. They heard it firsthand, which came from heaven, which were now with Him on the holy mountain. Now notice. Here's the background. Peter says, no myths, no legends, no fables. We saw it with our own eyes. We heard it with our own ears. But then he says this verse. And so... Now what could be used as another phrase? But we have a, the prophetic word confirmed. The translators actually say this phrase could be, the prophetic word is more fully confirmed. Peter is suggesting that the prophetic word of the Bible is more fully confirmed than an eyewitness and an earwitness and a first-hand testimony that he experienced. That's what Peter is saying. It's so profound. He's saying, in essence, he's suggesting the prophecy of Scripture is a more certain basis for the belief in Jesus and His return than Peter and others' own witness of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now I thought I'd hear at least one amen. Isn't that powerful, friends? That the prophetic word he's saying is more fully confirmed than an eyewitness testimony. Wow. You see, prophecy has purposes and principles that are rooted in it. So we want to look at some pur a purpose and principle of prophecies today. We want to look at those. So let's just review that number one, it's, a more, it's on a more certain basis than someone's eyewitness testimony. So somebody can come to you and say, well, and this has happened to a friend of mine. They were preaching in the South and doing some prophecy meetings and someone came and said, hey, pastor, um, I heard that this... Jesus appeared in the next state, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to check it out. And this pastor was saying uh, he hadn't quite got to the topic of the second coming. Say, I don't think that's a good idea. You shouldn't go. They said, but others have come, and they have seen it with their own eyes. They've heard it. The pastor said, ah, it's not a good idea. And he shared with that individual what the Bible says. Every eye is going to see. Every ear is going to hear. They're going to say he's in the desert, he's in the secret places. Don't go. Prophecy more sure and more certain than an eyewitness testimony. Peter says that it's a light that shines in a dark place. Let's keep reading. He says, we have this more fully confirmed, the prophetic word which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Are we living in a dark year, friends? Man, 2020, can it get any darker? We'll know in a few days, won't we? Next week, uh, it's probably going to get darker no matter who gets elected, right? Man, can it get any darker? Uh, people saying we're on the verge of a crisis, a, a crash, ep economic. As a prophecy is a light that shines in a dark place. Notice, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Isn't that beautiful? 
Prophecy has a point, a purpose until it brings the consummation of Jesus Christ more fully in our hearts. The morning star shines in our everyday lives. We can study prophecy as an abstract principle and, and dates and numbers and figures and charts, but if it doesn't impact our hearts, if it doesn't make me a more loving husband, a more loving spouse, then what's the point? Prophecy has that in mind. That it lifts up Jesus and illuminates the darkness in our hearts so that He can more fully come in. It has a function. It has a purpose. It has principles. Light on our path. If someone wanted to destroy Christianity, all they would have to do is find one failed prophecy. You know, I, I would challenge the skeptics and the atheists out there that if they want to destroy Christianity, just simply find one prophecy that has failed. Do you know how many prophecies there are in the Bible? Some say there's about 2,500. And roughly about 2,000 have been fulfilled already. To the letter, to the T. So that should challenge any unbeliever, any atheist, to go to those prophecies and say, okay, here's one that failed. I mean, there's still 500 or so left remaining, but according to the biblical track record, 2,000 out of 2,500 to the T, I think they're going to be right on track to coming to fruition. The Bible, the prophetic word, is authoritative, containing in itself the proof of its divine origin. The prophetic word more fully confirmed. More fully confirmed. Prophecy should speak to us about a God who has personal concern in our lives. Amen? It verifies the truthfulness of God's Word. Many an atheist have read and come to seminars just like the one we had, listened to the prophecy of Daniel 2, and seen God's hand through 2,600 years of history, 2,600 years of prophetic history, 2,600 years in advance, and saw it fulfilled to the letter, and many have been converted from their atheism, from their agnosticism, because of the prophetic word. There should be personal evidence, a prophetic personal evidence in our lives. A per principle and purpose of prophecy is it gives us confidence that the past, present, and future is in His hands. Amen? God is the God of the past. He's the God of the present, the here and now, but also the God of the future. And the prophecies are in His hands. Which means that history is in His hands. Amen? Doesn't it say in Daniel 2, God raises up kings right, and takes them down. God takes that prerogative in a very personal way. The past, the present, the future. Here's one prophecy, and I think we know this. Isaiah 45, you know God called Cyrus by name 150 years before he was ever born. And he actually called and said and mentioned the work that he would do in loosing the gates, referring to the city of Babylon and how Cyrus would overthrow the city. Called him by name 150 years. Now we can look at that and just think, well, that's an interesting fact, but you know what tells me? That God knows us by name before we were born. He knows us, who we are, why and what and how and when, long before we were even thought of. Some of you have heard this story. You remember last winter I was skiing with John. Man, we went up to White Pass and got off the lift. It was a little icy. I was on the inside, slipped and hit my head and I was kind of blacked out. It was the last thing I remembered. I didn't really know where I was or who I was, what I was, where I was, why I was, any of that. And John was asking me questions and I was just like dazed and confused. And I thought about that and I thought, I'm thankful that there's a God in heaven that knows my name. He knows all about me and He knew exactly where I was and what happened and my purpose and my destiny in life. And there's a God in heaven that says the same thing about you. 
about each one of us. You see, prophecy can be personal. Prophecy can be taken in a very practical way. In a very practical way. It gives us confidence that the past, the present, the future is in God's hands. And another interesting point about prophecy, it exposes the plans of the enemy. And I'm thankful for that because the enemy's battle plan, his strategic plans for trying to overthrow humanity and God's people in the church is all outlined in prophet, the prophetic word. It's all there in the Scriptures. It's like a, a game of chess and the unseen mover behind the scenes. We see what's going on in the Scriptures. It's revealed to us. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Paul enumerates on this in principle. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. He says, Let lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You see, as you open the prophetic Word, it reveals truth and light. And when you turn on the light, it dispels the darkness. And it reveals the darkness and the secret plans is modus operandi of the enemy taking place through systems, churches, Babylon, governments, society, secret societies, things like that that are working in harmony with the enemy. Exposing the spiritual entities and the enemy's work. A harlot and her daughters that compose Babylon. These fallen systems, fallen churches saying come out of them. Exposing error. That's why it says in Revelation, Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. You know why it says it's fallen, it's fallen twice? You know, God doesn't waste words because Babylon fell once in Daniel chapter 5, literal Babylon, and then Babylon is fallen again in spiritual Babylon. He's saying Babylon is, is fallen, it's fallen. God says, come out of her, my people. So part of the prophetic word, friends, is it reveals the light of Jesus. You turn the lights on, what happens? It exposes the cockroaches. And there's a lot of prophetic cockroaches that need to be exposed to see the enemy for all that he's worth. Amen? But can I just say something? That it's important to not make the cardinal focus of our study on the darkness. Amen? on the expose of the prophetic word, looking into the intricacies of Babylon and what that composes and all of this stuff is all well and good. But if we overfocus on the darkness, then what? We're not actually looking at the light. We're not embracing the light like we should. And often there's people out there that do that. They become critical, judgmental. And John the Baptist... Did he expose some of the things of his day? You brood of vipers! That was harsh, wasn't it? But what did he say? Behold the Lamb. He understood the Lamb of God. Did Jesus say some harsh things about the religious leaders? He did. But we're told there were what? Tears in his voice as he shared some of these things. Did Elijah share some of these things? He did. But Elijah had an experience in the cave where God came to him and he heard God's voice. Remember that? Wasn't in the wind. Wasn't in the fire. Right? It was in a still, small voice. Prophecy. Exposing the enemy. Let's keep going in our purpose and principles of prophecy. Prophecy points are climaxes in the great consummation. I, we can't overemphasize this, that prophecy has a purpose. It has a trajectory in which it is going. A direction. Daniel chapter 2. What's the, the, the big picture there? 2,600 years of history in advance. Where is it going? To the stone that's crushing all these earthly kingdoms. A stone cut without hands. Jesus Christ, the, the rock of ages that will not roll. The rock that was cleft for you and for me. 
That's the, the focus, the trajectory, the end point, the consummation that all the prophecies focus on. Here, let's just do a, a survey, a preview of the book of Daniel. Okay, book of Daniel in 30 seconds. You ready? Daniel 2. Notice, we looked at Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, judgment, Christ's kingdom. Daniel chapter 7 parallels that. Got a Babylon, lion, Medo-Persia by the bear, Greece, a leopard, Rome, that beast with horns, a little horn comes up. And then you have a judgment scene. And then Christ's kingdom right there in Daniel chapter 7. You get to Daniel chapter 8. There's no Babylon. Why? Because Babylon was leaving the scene. It was going into non-existence, being overthrown by the second kingdom, the Medes and the Persians, represented by the ram with two horns. And then you have a he-goat. And then you had four horns, and then a little horn, and then you have a cleansing of the sanctuary, and then an executive judgment. You see the, how the parallels fit perfectly? Everything is flowing. God isn't just abstract and random and mosaic with here and there, but there's cohesiveness. Everything is synced together. It's, it's flowing to a logical trajectory, to a conclusion. And then you get to Daniel 11. I mean, that's like PhD stuff, right? You have four kings, a mighty king, a king of the north, a king of the south, king of the north, um, and then the this would be the king of the south there, and the time of the end. Then Michael stands up. Jesus comes back for his people. You see the flow through Daniel. That was a little longer than 30 seconds, but that was pretty fast, right? You ready for Revelation? Okay, let's look at Revelation. Here it is. You've got a lot, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, and the parallels with the seven plagues. Where does it all point? It's all got a trajectory pointing to the second coming of Jesus. All of them all have interconnected points, and they all run to the consummation of Jesus Christ. All of them. All of them. We can't miss that, friends. It's very important, I think, to see that they focus and go in that way. Do you know that actually it's, there's two types of prophecy? Two types of prophecy. Number one, there's classical prophecy, and this makes up the majority of the Old Testament. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Zechariah, Haggai. The, these are what you call, maybe they looked at minor prophets. These are classical prophets. In other words, they were prophets and prophecy for their day, for that national religion of Israel, and they applied for that specific location, to that specific group. Now, I'm not saying there's not maybe a, another a dual application or there's not nuances in those classical books that, that actually for because surely they have some of them, many more than one fulfillment. But just in the large, big picture, they represented by those books. But you know, there's only two books in the Bible that fall under this category, what we call predictive or apocalyptic prophecy. Who knows what those books are? Daniel and Revelation, where the, the large percentage, the overwhelming majority of the books are apocalyptic in nature. They're pointing forward to beyond their day to beyond their day. Daniel and Revelation must be studied together. Let's look at a purpose and principles of prophecy. Here's my point. Daniel and Revelation need to be studied together. Did you know that Jesus recommended the book of Daniel? I think we'll look at it here. Jesus recommended the book of Daniel. Matthew 24:15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Jesus is actually commending a study of the book of Daniel. Now, Jesus doesn't do that with many other Hebrew Old Testament books. So when Jesus says that, that's pretty important. Hey, the abomination of desolation is going to be, it's in Daniel. You're going to see it. When you see it, then... You need to understand. You're thinking, what's the abominational desolation? Well, that's for another time. I have to do that at another time. But it's important, friends, to study the books of Daniel and Revelation uh, together. Now, let me just try to illustrate this. I, I brought with me a, a sermon prop 
Yeah, you like it? It's um, Legends of the Wild West, and it's got Josiah's name on it. It's his. It's a family heirloom. It's been passed down from generation to generation. Josiah got it from his cousin, Alden. So one generation to his gener generation, generation. Yeah, not making this up. So prophecy... Daniel and Revelation is kind of like these two sights on the gun. You got a back sight and you got a front sight. And as you take a gun and you line up those sights, you're going to hit your target. But what are people doing today? They, what happens if I don't line those sights up? I don't want to aim it out here. I don't want to point it at anybody. I'll point it at the wall. But if I don't line those sights up and they're just off, what's going to happen? Now, when that bullet leaves from here, it's not going to be that far off. But the further that bullet goes for its target, what's going to happen? It's going to be way off, right? I'm going to, you know, shoot off. It's going to be an offshoot there. It's going to just shoot off into nothingness. And so it's important for us as we take the books of Daniel and Revelation that we line them up. Because when we do, we will hit our target. And too many people today within Christianity, even our own church, are not lining up the prophecies like the sights of a gun and they're veering off. And I want to just show you a couple of examples here. Remember Daniel 7. We don't have time to look at it. But Daniel chapter 7, Daniel sees in vision uh, a great seas. And out of the water comes these four beasts. A lion, a bear, a leopard, and this nondescript beast with ten horns and a little horn. Remember that? Daniel 7. He sees water. And then he sees lion, a bear, a leopard, and this with four heads. And then he sees this nondescript beast with ten horns. Now come to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says. John gets his imagery right from the book of Daniel chapter 7. Notice what John sees. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Where did Daniel see the beast coming? Out of the sea in Daniel 7. John says... I saw the beast coming up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. Now, how many heads do you count in this picture? Four, five, six, seven. Remember Daniel 7? Yep. Seven heads. How many horns are in Daniel chapter 7? Ten horns. Seven head, heads and ten horns. Just like Daniel saw in Daniel Seven. Notice what John sees here. Seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns. Ah, something unique there. And on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and the head feet like the feet of a bear, and the mouth like the mouth of a dragon, and the, the mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now do you notice something different from what Daniel saw? A lion, bear, leopard, and this ugly dragon-like beast. And what did John see? He saw a beast, this conglomerate beast that had ten horns, but then he saw it in reverse. Did you catch that in the text? He saw it, seven heads, ten horns, but it went from a leopard to a bear to a lion. Daniel sees lion, bear, leopard, and the ferocious beast. John sees the ferocious beast, the leopard, the bear, and the lion. Why would it be given that way? This is important. Don't miss it. J Daniel is living in the time of the lion, Babylon. And he's looking forward into history. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Little Horn. End of time. John the Revelator is living in the time of Rome and he's looking backwards in history. God gave this understanding to let us know that we're standing on solid ground. 
this principle that keeps us from straying. Well, this kingdom represents this, and this represents that, and well, I believe this. No. Daniel's looking forward in history. John standing at this vantage point, looking backward, and then there's some that's forward, showing they synchronize together. They totally sync. There's the, the picture there of Revelation 13, this nondescript beast. Interesting, isn't it? 600 years apart, Daniel and Revelation, yet they sync together. They have synergy, this synergistic element to them. Amazing, isn't it? How many have ever uh, get a book and they read the last chapter of the book? before you read it. Yeah. If you read the last chapter, in essence, you know what the book's about, right? And then, well, then you can put it down because you know what it's like. Well, that's kind of what studying prophecy is like. You look at prophecy and it's like, ah, we know the end game. We know who wins. God is giving us a roadmap of history. This is how we know we're on solid ground. Here's another clue that links us from Daniel to Revelation. Remember how it says in Revelation 18, Babylon is fallen. Do you know how many allusions or quotes there are from Revelation to the Old Testament? Scholars say that there are over 600 references, quotes, or allusions to the Old Testament. So you cannot study Revelation, the prophecies, without looking at Daniel and other places. Where is Babylon fallen? You simply got to go to Daniel chapter 5. To Daniel chapter 5. Let's go there. Daniel chapter 5. How did Babylon fall? You see, that which is literal in the Old Testament becomes spiritual in the New. There's not a literal kingdom of Babylon that is going to exist in 2020. It's a spiritual nature, a spiritual entity. But we can learn from the literal how the spiritual applies. How did Babylon fall? Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of a thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple and which had been in Jerusalem that the kings and the lords and his wives and concubines might drink from him. And they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house and God which had from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and wives, and they drank from them. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And then we learn later that Babylon falls, and Daniel comes to Belshazzar, and he says, you knew all this, and you did it anyway. He knew those vessels were sacred, They stole them out of the temple, the sanctuary of God. They took sacred vessels that were to be set aside and used for only that holy and sacred purpose. And they took those sacred vessels and they took them and they put in their wine. And then they passed it around and everybody became drunk. There's a spiritual lesson here, friends. Why does Babylon fall in the end of time? Because Babylon, the spiritual entity, takes something that is sacred, set apart for a specific use, and they desecrate it by the wine of Babylon, making the whole world drunk. Sunday sacredness. They take the Sabbath, set apart, sacred for a holy use, and they take that and they misuse it, they mistreat it, they misrepresent it, and they switch it into Sunday. The wine of Babylon. And they propagate that to the whole world and the whole world becomes drunk with the wine of Babylon. Something that was to be sacred, those vessels for God. There's a parallel there. Let's keep going in our study. We could talk more about that purpose and principles of prophecy. Daniel and Revelation should be studied together. We need to be aware of false interpretations. Amen? Boy, there's some false interpretations out there uh, today. And if some of you didn't remember from Nehemiah's seminar, 
We know that there's a couple of them. There's what you call preterism and futurism. Preterism propagated by a, a gentleman by the name of Han Hank Hanegraaff. Anybody ever heard of Hank Hanegraaff? He's called the Bible Answer Man. Just has the Bible like memorized, can answer all these questions. Well, he believes in this view of prophetic interpretation called preterism. What's pre? That's before, right? All the majority of the prophecies were long fulfilled in the past. Nero and Antiochus Epiphanes and, you know, back in that time, Rome, yep, they're all fulfilled. No need to look at Daniel and Revelation. Not many people buy that. A small group believe in that. But the overwhelming majority believe in this whole futuristic belief, futurism, that's been propagated by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, Hal Lindsey. And they say the majority of prophecies, they're, they're all going to be fulfilled in the future. You're going to have a seven-year tribulation. You know that nowhere in the Bible do you find seven-year tribulation? But yet they come up with this seven-year tribulation and in the middle of the week, the Antichrist is going to come, make a pact with the Jews, cause the sacrifices to cease, and they twist a prophecy and they apply it all to the future. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't believe either of these views. I think they're both faulty. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe in what we call historicism. Historicism says this, that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation take a historicist, progressive fulfillment throughout history. They begin in the time of the prophet, Daniel, and they take a historical, literal, progressive fulfillment throughout history all the way up to the coming of Jesus. That's historicism. And you know that the overwhelming majority of the Reformers believe that? Martin Luther and Huss and Wycliffe, Jerome and Calvin and most of the mainline Protestant churches used to believe in historicism. And I want to say that we and maybe a few others are like the lone rangers that believe that today. We're not better than anybody else, but we want to stand on this head, the heads and shoulders of those great godly reformers and say, oh, we can see a little bit further. Amen. Historicism. Let's keep going as we wrap this up. Beware of false interpretations. And last, and cannot be overemphasized enough, the prophecies need to be christ centered. Amen? they got to be Christocentric. Christocentric. Come with me to John chapter 1, verse 45. John chapter 1, and notice verse 45. If you remember the story, Jesus was calling His disciples. And notice John chapter 1, He had called um, a couple of disciples here. Let's begin in John one, uh, let's begin in verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, We have found him who Moses in the law and also the prophets, who Jesus of Nazareth wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What's the point here? Jesus was calling some of his disciples. He was calling Philip. And what did Philip do? He went to Nathanael with an overwhelming excitement. Why? Firstly, because Jesus said, follow me. But secondly, because he said, we have found him. We found the Christ that was written about in Moses, in the writings, of the law. And the prophets, in other words, Nathaniel was excited. Philip was excited when he went to Nathaniel because of what he understood about the prophetic word that pointed to Jesus. Why? Because they were focused on Christ. Christ-centered. That Old Testament messianic prophecy being christ -centered. Centered. Isn't that a beautiful picture, friends? Do you know that in the book of Revelation, Jesus is spoken of as the Lamb more than any other book in the Bible? 27 times. More than any other place in Scripture. Why? He's the central focus. 
He's not only the lamb, but he's the priest. It has sanctuary language. It has language that points us to the work and plan of salvation. Points us to to God, to Jesus, to his work that he wants to do for humanity. There's much more I could say about this, but you know, it's the Revelation has numerous references to to Christ, to the sanctuary, the service, the lamb, the priest. You know, interesting that the book of Revelation begins with a revelation of Jesus Christ. It begins with the phrase about Jesus. And you know, the last chapter, the last verse, it actually ends about Jesus. The book begins with Jesus and ends with Jesus. And I just love what John says in Revelation 1.8, Jesus says it. John records it. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Interesting. The Alpha and the Omega. This is a remarkable statement. In the Greek language, the Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And from the alphabet, you make words. And Jesus is called the Word of God. He's the Word. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. He's eternity and beyond. And if we were to say in our modern vernacular, He's the A to Z and everything in between. Anybody ever seen a, the ABCs of Jesus in every letter of the alphabet? Well, I, I, I've got that and I want to share that this morning. He's the Alpha, the Amen, and our anchor. He's the beginning, the bread of life, and our brother, the bright and morning star, and the bridegroom. He's the captain and the cornerstone. He's the day star, the door, and our deliverer. He's the everlasting Father, everlasting love, eternal life, and our El Shaddai. He's the fountain of life, the first, the foundation of our faith, and the fairest among ten thousands. He's the glory of His people and the good shepherd and the gate. He's the high priest, the head of all things, the healing balm of Gilead. He's the intercessor and Emmanuel, God with us. He's Jehovah. He's Jesus. Jehovah Jireh. He is just and He's the judge of all the earth. He's the King of kings and our kinsman. He's the lion and the lamb. He's the lily of the valley. He is love. He's the light of the world and the Lord of hosts. He's the Messiah, the mediator. He's the manna. He's the mighty God. He's a Nazarene. And He's got a name above all names. He's the Omega, the offspring of David and the overcomer. He's the prophet, the promise of God, the Prince of Peace and our Passover Lamb. He's the quail. From heaven. He's the Redeemer, the Rock, the Root of Jesse, the Rose of Sharon, and the Resurrection. He's the Son of God, the Sword, the Shield, and Sacrifice for Sin. He's the Tree of Life, the Teacher, the Tabernacle, and the Truth. He's the Unseen Guest, the Untold Story, and the Unconditional Love. He's the Vine. He's the Veil that was rent from top to bottom. He's the water of life, the way, the Word made flesh, and the wonderful Counselor. And even has x-ray vision to read the hearts of all humanity. He's the Zerubbabel of the New Testament and the glory of Mount Zion. He will never leave me nor forsake me. Never mislead me, never forget me, never overlook me, never cancel my appointment in His appointment book on his busy days. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he forgives me. When I am weak, he's strong. When I'm lost, he's the way. When I'm afraid, he's my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I'm hurt, he heals me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I'm blind, he leads me. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he's with me. When I face persecution, he shields me. When I face problems, He comforts me. When I face loss, He provides for me. When I face death, 
He gives me life. He's everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, and every way. He is God. He's faithful. I am His. And He is mine. Is He yours today? Is Jesus the prophetic word of your life? Is He the the central focus of the prophecies, the consummation of our great hope? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank You for the word, the prophetic word that Peter says is, is even more certain than an eyewitness and earwitness testimony. And we have that today, Lord, in 2020, a dark year, but yet prophecy can shine brightly and dispel the darkness in the world today. And we want to be like Philip that went to Nathaniel. He went to someone he cared about with excitement and he shared with him that he had found somebody, that he had been called to be a disciple. And how did he know? Because it was revealed in the prophetic word. So, God, we pray that you would live within each one of us, our hearts, more fully. That as you reveal yourself and the prophetic word, that we would fall more in love with you day by day. For we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.